Yuma, welcome to Ngunnawal Country here in Canberra. I'm Dan Boyle. I've been really proud to work on the Speaking Up program with my colleague Bridget Brennan, where we've looked at the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the opportunities and challenges ahead, and some of the many different Indigenous perspectives on what the voice could be, what it could look like, what it could do, and if it's actually needed at all. You can watch the whole Speaking Up program right here on iview. As part of the conversation, I sat down with Aluar woman, Ani Pat Anderson, the co-chair of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The respected advocate for the rights and health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people said now is the time to include Indigenous people at the tables where decisions are made and to truly hear their perspectives. I began by asking Ani Pat Anderson for her reaction to the theme of NAIDOC week, get up, stand up, show up. It's perfect for where the nation is now. We're, we're asking people to support the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which calls for an enshrined voice in the Constitution, First Nations voice in the Constitution. That's really important. It's real structural reform, political reform. And for the first time ever, it will have us sitting at the table with the Parliament of the day, making decisions about all of the disadvantage that affects us, not only the disadvantage, but the good things as well. This hasn't happened before. All decisions about us since forever, for a long time anyhow, um, have been made by uh, non-Indigenous people. And it's our turn where, you know, Australia is one of the few liberal democracies in the world which has no arrangement, no settlement with its first peoples. And this is what the Uluru Statement is asking for, to go for an enshrined voice. We must have a referendum. And that's what, uh, so the, um, the slogan, the theme rather, for the, this 2020 NAIDOC Day fits in perfectly with that call, that cry, that plea, accepting the gift that we gave to the Australian people in 2017. How did you get to the point of that gift? What led to that? Well, what led to it is generation after generation after generation of activism. Any achievements or advancement that we've made have all been through our own activism. There's no doubt about that, and we've been doing this for a very long time. But this current process, once again, seeking justice in our own country and in our own lands, is, goes, has a long history, as well, certainly all of us know, goes around a long time. But this latest process is about 10, 12 years old, started with Julia Gillard. I think in seven years, we had something like eight different select committee reports. We have the theme, you know, history is calling, it's very clear because we've been doing this for a very long time, the latest process, like I say. We had uh, a series of a deliberative process of meetings, uh, well, we call them dialogues, regional dialogues around the country. We spoke to, um, we had 13, we wanted to do more, but the budget only allowed for 13. But out of that process um, came people from each of those meetings, selected delegates, to go to the, um, the convention, the Constitutional Convention, which was held at Uluru. Uh, I was part, I co-chaired the Referendum Council with Mark Liebler and Megan Davis and Noel Pearson. It's a large committee, um, 16, 16 people. So the culmination of, of all of that work um, was the convention, which came up with the Uluru Statement from the Heart which has been people like, um, you know, former High Court judges and the legal fraternity uh, have said publicly, pretty much straight away, there is no legal impediment to having a voice, a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. There is no legal impediment. It's to do with politics. So we're going to, we and now the leadership that's been provided by our new Prime Minister will look as though it's going to lead um, to a referendum. So we might get real structural reform um, after all. The Uluru Statement calls for voice that you've touched on. We'll go into more of that in a moment. Treaty and truth. Why in that order and what does that all look like as a whole picture? What it says is um, uh, the sequence is important, a as you say, but a voice to parliament followed by uh, Makarara, who oversee um, agreement making and um, truth-telling. So they're, they're inextricably mixed. Now, if we don't have a voice, because at the moment we have no place that will, what will be agency, 
you know, the National Indigenous Agency, will they select people? Will they set up the process like they did with the previous, the last select committee that uh, Minister Wyatt um, set up? Um, so <laughs> we want to ex exercise real self-determination here. So we want to be in charge of how that's set up and who, who, who's involved and how we do it and what have you. So if we don't have a voice, the government of the day, so there'll be no change here. There's no change if we, do, if we do that. So there has to be the voice which will lead, manage and conduct all, all of the other things like the Makarata process which goes for agreement making, as I've said, accompanied with truth telling. We want to be in charge of that. I don't think that's complicated. We know that Australians are reluctant to change the constitution. What the Uluru Statement is calling for is an entrenchment, enshrinement within our foundation document. Mm. There's been some discussion that there's not the detail there. What do you say to that? All we're asking for, and this is done by design, and enabling two or three sentences in the constitution. It's not saying change section, you know, four new, uh, section four, room and numeral six. We're not, uh, we're not going anywhere near that because we are afraid of putting anything more in the constitution that might put our sovereignty in danger or under discussion. So we, it, was a perp it was a purposely made decision to make these simple adjustments. We needed to have, we needed the voice enshrined, a protected voice enshrined in the constitution so the government of the day wouldn't be able to sign us away which has been the, the history all the in my life just in my lifetime all the government uh, government agencies that we've set up they've been just gotten away with by you know, the whim of the, the minister or the prime minister of the day they now we're not doing that anymore we're going to do this instead so we need to be enshrined so when there's a change of government we'll just sit and wait and when the new government comes in or the new minister, prime minister, the new ministers will say, well, this is where we got up last time with the other mob. So here we go. This is what we need to do now. Because what happens now, every time there's a change, we have to go back to ground zero as if nothing has happened. Uh, and it just keep, we can make, we can't make any pro real progress here if we keep going, you know, two steps forward and six back. So is the idea that you entrench in the constitution the enabling words to create yes a item a, a voice a voice and then the, the detail does that come that'll through be done by legislation as a lot of other things have been done you can't put the whole act or the bill in the constitution just two or three very simple sentences which calls for um a first nations voice to be enshrined in the constitution which gives us a, gives that protection we haven't had before and then all the detail will be done by legislation, which is, you know, sensible because if we put it in the constitution, it's locked in there, but if it's by legislation, we can adjust it and change it as we go along. Is there precedent of, of where this is? Yeah, I think done? there is. Um, I think things that were set up in the past, I think like the High Court, I mean, I think even the Constitution of Australia, I think Productivity Commission, we have quite a lot. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, um, as you know, Dan, but there have been precedents. Not everything goes in the... It, poss it You can't. So, I mean, we just had this process that um, Minister Wyatt um, set up. Surely there must be something there that we could look at. Um, they must have come there, come, but they were, they, were, they were looking at the status quo, just a voice to government, which is no, no reform here. That's, what, that's the point. That's what, we have all, that's what we've always been doing, talking to the Minister of the Day, talking to the Prime Minister of the Day. When there's a change, like I say, we go back to square one. There's no protection there for us. So. By having a voice to government, we already have that. There's no reforms there. So it has to be, we have nowhere else to go. We've done everything that's been asked of us. We asked, they asked us to get educated and we did. So we've been very compliant all the time. You know, people like myself, we've gone on to committees thinking that, well, maybe we can make change there. And we try and we compromise ourselves, but there's very little change. So we're tired of it. We're really tired of it. This generation, it's our turn to reimagine. Reimagine what Australia could and should be. And that's the call to all Australians. Let's do something different here. Let's try to deal with this challenge, the, the, the challenge of our powerlessness, the challenge of all the disadvantage, because that's what the voice will do. It will deal, we know our, our communities and our families best. So we should be sitting down with the parliament of the day, identifying all these issues and how we might find some solutions rather than this continuous, you know, 
stumbling around, in, in, oftentimes in confusion or having a go. Let's have a go, but with some purpose and some power. If we're sitting there with the parliament, we will be there making decisions on all of the, th all the decisions that affect us and all the policies and the, and, the, and, the, and the legislation of the day. So we will be sitting there, not usurping, not uh, anything to do with threatening the sovereignty of the parliament, but sitting there as partners, giving the, so government can make better decisions for the day and better use, and we might, heaven help, we might be able to begin to deal with, really deal with some of the disadvantage and the racism in this country. When I was chair of the Lowerture Institute, we, could, we, we proved in, you know, that racism makes us sick. This country, you know, we, we, we can do this. You know, it's time to deal with this unfinished business that Patrick Dodson um, aptly named um, some time ago. And sitting here is this wonderful gift, this gracious, gracious gift to the Australian public. I would urge the Australian, read, for goodness sake, read the statement. Try to inform yourself and understand what we're trying to do here. It, <laughs> you know, Australia is one of the few liberal democracies in the world which doesn't have any settlement, any arrangement with its first peoples. The Sami, for instance, there are lots of examples around the globally um, the Sami, for instance, had their own parliament. Now, you know, the Scandinavian countries haven't slipped into a field or anything like that. They're still prospering, you know, and doing very well. We can do this. We can do better than we're doing. We can do this. Do you think Australians will support this? Look, the stats are, are quite good. We've been, we are um, part of the regional dialogue with, with Megan Davis and her team for the last five years. In fact, the first week that we left Uluru, we set up a web page. So we've been, we've been five years talking like this and talking to anybody and everybody um, who will listen. And there has been a shift. Um, I think one of the latest figures, uh, well over 50% anyhow, um, have said they would vote yes at a, a referendum. And now that figure is, is slipping, you know, it getting, getting uh, more and more. So we've been running stats, as all my gov runs stats. So the, the statistics generally are showing um, quite a gradual shift towards a, towards a yes vote. We already have a couple of years ago 51%, and that's increasing. So all indications, you know, the, tradi the traditional ones anyhow, tell us, given you know the variables that go into all of those kinds of surveys. But nevertheless, um, that kind of measure is showing. Um, a majority of Australians would vote um, would vote yes. There's undecided, and and also that's been that group's been surveyed as well. Once people get access to information, they are more inclined to change their vote from undecided to yes. So it's looking good. The statistics are looking good. What did you think when former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull described the Uluru statement as calling for a third chamber? Rubbish, absolute rubbish. And it was really disingenuous. He hasn't spoken to any of us since that since that time, but it really did. And then Barnaby Joyce came out with his sense apologised, but nevertheless, damage was done. There is no um, two ways about that. It was very disingenuous on behalf of Malcolm Turnbull um, at the time, and it's taken us you know, quite a while to overcome uh, that. And it was just completely unfounded. It's just off the top of somebody's head, but they all took up the cry that it's going to be a third, to scare, to scare the Australian public of their own people, us. You know, after all, you know, we share this continent, this is our place. And for him to say something like that without even talking to anybody was, oh, any, well, to us, really disingenuous. He will go down on the wrong side of history, that Prime Minister. When Anthony Albanese won the May federal election, he spoke about the Uluru Statement in his very first news conference. He'd spoken about it in the election campaign. Just this week, in a, a, a big interview with 7.30 with Lee Sales, he again spoke about it being something that is driving him forward. How do you react to those sorts of comments? First of all, on election night, I think we've all cried. Just couldn't, couldn't believe that the first thing that came out of the new Prime Minister's mouth was support unreservedly in its entirety the Uluru statement um, from the heart. He accepted the gift. And we're very, uh, we just, well, it's just wonderful. That was what was missing over this last five years, leadership. So the new Prime Minister has provided real leadership here. He's very solid, he gets it. 
he understands it. And I think, you know, with the way the, um, the election result is, and I'm no expert there either, but it looks like they will, the legislation will pass for the bill, will pass through the, through the parliament so we can go to um, referendum. There have been a variety of Indigenous voices yes. speaking about the Uluru Statement from the heart. Some who say uh, that it puts at risk treaty sovereignty or doesn't go far enough on either of those areas. What do you say to that? We respect all views. That's a democracy. There's no question of that. Um, but we went through a particular... Pro this is not me talking, or Megan Davis or Noel Pierce. This is all of those people. It's a tribute to them. You know, even, you know, people like Murray, uh, Murray Gleeson has said um, no constitutional lawyer even thought about this, that when it came through the wisdom of all of those people that came um, to the Uluru, that whole process. So it's them that are asking for um, truth, uh, you know, voice treaty truth. Although, as you know, we didn't use the word um, treaty in the... Um, in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, it's, it's um, voice, makarara, which means agreement making, and also um, the, uh, and, and um, truth telling. Mm. So everyone's entitled to their opinion, but we are, this is the most uh, extensive deliberative process that we've ever had. We haven't been asked before. So this is a, um, a very robust, um, and it's a tribute uh, process that got to the Uluru Statement from that. It was completely out of the box. We didn't expect it either. Um, we went to the convention, uh, to the convention uh, after all of those meetings, which we'd um, uh, recorded every meeting. We analysed all of the said at those meetings and that what came out. So the, everything that's, every word, every sentiment that's in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, somebody told us during the process of that um, dialogue it process. Somebody said it. Mm. So that's what makes up the Ula Reserve. It's a very um, intensive, uh, dense process. There's also been discussion about the immediate uh, challenging circumstances, closing the gap, uh, Indigenous incarceration rates, recidivism, child protection issues. How do they fit in with the broader discussion of the Ula Reserve? That's the very reason, because everything we've tried so far hasn't worked. You know, it's been very limited, um, uh, very limited, because we still have this huge, you know, in the Northern Territory, I know you know this, Dan, because you come from there too. We have 10 year olds, 10, 11, 12 year olds, almost 24 hours a day in spittles, for goodness sake. And the, the violence, everything that's going on, the race, everything is happening. That's what the voices are going to deal with, because everything we've done up to here hasn't really worked, because there's still. You know, it's the torment, what we've said in this statement. It's the torment of our powerlessness, which is our continuing challenges of all the disadvantage that we continue to face today. And that's what the voice is. Once and for all, we're going to have a, a process. We'll be locked into the framework of the, of the government of the day without ceding anything. It says very clearly, in the without, you know, we've never ceded our, prob our sovereignty and we never will. Hence, just those few sentences, no fiddling, fiddling, they use the word, fiddling with the constitution, just put in two or three sentences so we can do the real work, how it's all going to work by, via legislation which is, it's all been, that's been done before. This election saw the greatest number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people elected, 11 across both chambers from all parties and a majority of states and yes. territories as well. Almost 5% now of the parliament are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and about 10.5% of the Senate are Indigenous. There might be some who say, actually, that looks like a voice. Yes. Yeah. Um, some uh, commentators um, have said that, you know, we keep having to give the nation like basic civics lessons. First of all, we're really proud of all of those people. This is a great achievement. There's no doubt about that. However, they were elected to Parliament to speak for their constituency. We're hoping that they will bring, um, you know, First Nations lens to their decisions, but that is not their job. Their job is to represent the issues like all of the other politicians in both houses. They are there to represent the wishes of their constituency and they rely, you know, whether, on their, whether they get elected or not. So that's, 
that's their brief. But like I say, hopefully they will bring a lens to it. But that doesn't mean that we can still have the voice because that is not the voice that we're talking about. We're unfettered by any party uh, alignments or um, decisions that they make. We are speaking for everybody, you know, all, the, all of our families and all of our communities in the cities, in the rural area, in the small towns, in the communities and in, you know, outstations. The voice will be speaking for all of those people, even in the remotest locations. They will have a voice, say, for instance, from Kintor straight to Parliament via this mechanism that we are yet, to, we've all got some ideas of how it might work, the voice might work. But that's the whole objective. So that voice, it doesn't sift through anything. It goes directly from Kintor to the Parliament here in Canberra. What the voice looks like would be the conversation after a referendum then, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, we have to be ready um, for like the next day, say we have a successful referendum, we have to be ready for, well, this is what we do now. So that's, that's already being um, discussed because we do have to be ready. We can't say, well, oh, bugger me, you know, what are we going to do now? That's not going to happen. We're ready. What's the earliest date that you would like to see a referendum on this question of voice? 27th um, of May, uh, 2023. Um, ten so, months away. Yes, ten months away. But uh, is, that that, do, is that doable? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I think it is, or we think it is. Uh, for instance, there um, there is a bill um, that Megan Davis and her team have prepared um, that we presented, plus even um, the sorts of questions that might be asked. So they have a draft, if you like. Uh, to be working on. The, we have to talk more to the general public, there is no doubt about that, and we've been talking for five years, but now there's new energy which has been given to us by the, um, by the new Prime Minister, so we have to get out there and do a lot more than we have been doing. But like I say, even so after five years, we're getting, the, the country is generally swinging towards a, um, towards a yes vote. So our job is to educate and talk to as many Australians as possible and reach them by all kinds of venues so they understand this is nothing to be scared of. This is so we can have a new, a new nation. This is a gift. I want to, this is a gift um, to the Australian people. So we can have a nation, a, a mature and sophisticated nation, a reconciled one, if you like. That's a, I know that's a, a difficult word, but a nation that's more, um, well, it'll be, it'll be strengthened. This is nation building. This is once in a lifetime. Everybody out there over 18, it's our turn. It's our turn. And there's a real opportunity here given, and I think led now by the courage and the commitment, and I think the love um, of the new Prime Minister. And just finally, what do you say to Australians watching this right now who still don't know where they sit, aren't fully across all the detail of, of the conversations that have been had so far. There's lots to say, but let me just start off. You know, in 67, um, the wider population didn't even knew less about us than people know now. That's a big challenge because we're asking the population to know very little about us, really. But in 67, you know, people voted because it was the right thing to do. And as people told us, the older people, and as it went around to the referendum, there's a belief in the common decency of the, of the Australian population, the Australian people. And the, the argument goes like this, as they told us, in different ways. We asked them in 67 to help us, and they did, and we're asking them again in the belief of, in the common decency of, uh, despite our bloody history and everything that's happened to us, there was this wonderful... Or, Wonderful generosity. I think we must be the most generous people in the whole world. Annie Pat Anderson, thank you for